Greetings fellow aficionados of true crime. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we're delving into a case that embodies both an eerie chill and enigmatic intrigue. A case that has baffled investigators and captured the collective fascination of many. The Rhonda Sue Coleman murder case. In this video, we'll be exploring the details, twists, and turns surrounding this tragic event that unfolded in Hazelhurst, Georgia on May 17, 1990, while also acknowledging the lasting imprint it has left behind. As we explore the evidence, witness, accounts, and tireless efforts of those dedicated to bringing justice to Rhonda Sue Coleman, it serves as a poignant reminder that behind every headline and every crime statistic, there's a human story that deserves to be told giving a voice to those who can no longer speak. The victim of this inscrutable tragedy, Rhonda Sue Coleman, an 18-year-old high school senior, met her untimely demise under circumstances that raised more questions than answers. Her lifeless body, partially charred, was discovered amidst the dense foliage of a wooded expanse in neighboring Montgomery County, Georgia. However, her story transcends the confines of the crime itself unearthing the profound repercussions felt by those who held her dear and the broader community she was a part of. So buckle up as we peel back the layers of this haunting mystery and attempt to piece together the puzzle that is the Rhonda Sue Coleman murder case. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you won't miss any of our forthcoming investigations. With that said, let us now delve into the heart of the matter. Rhonda Sue Coleman was born on January 18, 1972, in Hazelhurst, Georgia. She held a job as a cashier at the local Piggly Wiggly grocery store and actively participated in the community as a member of the Tabernacle Baptist Church of Hazelhurst. Tragedy struck this vibrant soul at the youthful age of 18, a cruel twist of fate that unfolded shortly before her high school graduation from Jeff Davis High School. Her presence within the student body was accompanied by considerable popularity. This was largely attributed to her lively and amicable character. Those who knew her recall a person who radiated positivity, always ready to extend assistance and offer warm greetings. Her genial nature made it effortless for her to forge connections swiftly, and she was in the process of preparing to attend Georgia State University to pursue studies in nursing with a specific focus on working with newborns. Sadly, her community had no inkling of the impending and grievous occurrence that would prematurely conclude her life. On the evening of Rhonda's disappearance, a customary event for seniors at Jeff Davis High School took place. This event involved Rhonda and her fellow seniors gathering at a classmate's residence to decorate a banner for their upcoming graduation. This information was conveyed by her cousin, Natasha Bennett, during an interview with Dateline. Following the banner embellishment gathering, Rhonda accompanied a small group of students to a nearby convenience store. Subsequent to 10 p.m., Rhonda conveyed to her friends her need to depart in order to reach her residence by her 10.30 p.m. curfew. She mentioned her intention to make a stop at a nearby Hardy's Drive through en route. Thus, she left her friend to travel the five-kilometer, three-mile distance to her home, as shared by Natasha. Simultaneously on that very evening, Layla Miller Marshall, one of Rhonda's classmates was unable to attend the banner decoration festivities due to work commitments. Once she finished her work shift, she visited her boyfriend's house before proceeding homeward. Layla recounted to Dateline that Rhonda's home was a mere three kilometers, two miles, away from her own. Close to 10.30 p.m., while driving from her boyfriend's place to her residence, Layla encountered a parked car with illuminated headlights by the side of a dirt road. Layla remembered as I passed it, I saw that it was Rhonda's car, Layla recounted. So I turned around and went back. Her concern prompted her to retrace her path and approach the vehicle. She wished to ascertain Rhonda's well-being. Upon alighting from her own car, Layla observed that Rhonda's car was still running, its lights were switched on, and the driver's side door was ajar with Rhonda's purse left undisturbed within. Unfortunately, Rhonda was nowhere in sight. Layla then took the initiative to turn off the car's engine as cell phones were not as prevalent during that time. 
Layla decided to return to her boyfriend's residence to contact the authorities. Layla communicated that she and her boyfriend subsequently returned to the location of the parked car to await the arrival of law enforcement. In the midst of these events, Rhonda's parents, Milton and Gail Coleman, grew increasingly concerned about their daughter's whereabouts. Rhonda had surpassed her school night curfew, a rarity according to her father, Milton. He emphasized that Rhonda had an established pattern of punctuality, always notifying them if she anticipated being late, as the clock approached 11 p.m. Milton took it upon himself to drive around in search of his missing daughter. As time passed, Layla and her boyfriend remained at Rhonda's car, but with no sign of the police, they opted to return to her boyfriend's residence to place another call. Subsequently, they went back to Rhonda's car, only receiving police assistance when officers arrived at the scene at approximately 11.40 p.m. Steve Land, the retired chief of police for Hazelhurst, Georgia, recalled receiving a call from the 911 center approximately an hour and a half after the car was discovered. He remembered the collaborative effort of law enforcement agencies, including the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, the Jeff Davis County Sheriff's Office, and the Hazelhurst Police Department. During his search for Rhonda, her father, Milton, encountered police activity. I see the blue lights and I figured she went off the road or got in a wreck, Milton recalled. However, upon reaching the scene, he received the unsettling news that Rhonda was missing. Layla's recollection of the night, though hazy after nearly 28 years, included a poignant moment when Rhonda's father arrived at the scene. When her dad drove up was one of my most vivid memories, Milton urgently inquired, Layla. Where's Rhonda? Slayla's response was, Mr. Coleman, I don't know. At that instant, Layla could see Milton's eyes welling up with tears, and she sensed he had a deep intuition that something was gravely amiss. This unforgettable encounter stands as a testament to the distressing nature of the situation as Layla recounted in a conversation with Dateline. Despite the location of Rhonda's car within the boundaries of Hazelhurst, the Jeff Davis County Sheriff's Department promptly assumed control of the case. Deputies conducted a thorough examination of Rhonda's vehicle and its immediate vicinity, meticulously searching for any trace of the missing teenager. Upon inspecting the vehicle, law enforcement discovered Rhonda's purse inside. Additionally, they identified footprints leading from her 1989 Chevy Cavalier towards the tracks, left by another vehicle. The tire imprint strongly suggested that a different car unrelated to Layla's, had pulled over along the roadside on that fateful night. The absence of any signs of struggle led them to speculate that Rhonda might have been acquainted with the individual in the second vehicle. Special Agent Pro, presently overseeing the case, reflected, it's possible that she knew the person or persons that pulled up to where her vehicle was. Despite these possibilities, he admitted that the authorities have not yet definitively established the nature of this connection. As they searched along the road, investigators ran into a hunter exiting the woods about three kilometers, two miles, away from where Rhonda's car was found. The hunter recounted an incident from that evening as he and another man were engaged in fox hunting. Positioned close to their truck at the edge of a dirt road, they anticipate the distinctive barks of their hunting dogs, signaling the presence of potential prey in the vicinity. Abruptly, their anticipation was disrupted by the rapid approach of a speeding vehicle on the road. Amid the vehicle's passage, a woman's scream reaches their ears. Given the area's reputation as a lover's lane, the men initially dismissed the incident, attributing it to possibly exuberant teenagers. However, the following morning, the situation gains clarity as news emerges of the disappearance of 18-year-old Rhonda Sue Coleman on that very night. The scream they had heard takes on a more ominous significance. It was likely not a carefree expression, but rather a distressed plea, a final desperate effort to attract help. Nonetheless, over the span of three days, the police meticulously combed through the surrounding areas, sparing no effort in their search. Ultimately, at approximately 2.30 p.m., on Sunday, a man evaluating timber in a wooded area of Montgomery County made a grim discovery the body of Rhonda was uncovered. The location of the body was approximately five kilometers, three miles, from the Jeff Davis County boundary and roughly 24 kilometers, 15 miles, from where Rhonda's abandoned car had been located. 
The identity of the deceased teenager was confirmed by Montgomery County Coroner Lewis Palmer, turning a missing person case into an official homicide investigation. Tragically, Rhonda's body had suffered significant burns. Although the initial inquiry indicated that her death was the result of a homicide, the exact cause could not be definitively determined due to the extensive burns covering her body. The circumstances of Rhonda's demise were profoundly violent. Subsequent revelations, albeit unofficial, would eventually reveal that her death resulted from either strangulation or positional asphyxia. The coroner's examination established that her assailant covered her head and hands with gasoline before igniting her body. Despite the severity of the burns, she was found fully dressed and no signs of sexual assault were evident. The remote and secluded nature of the location where her body was left led detectives to speculate that the perpetrator was likely acquainted with the area. The heartbreaking news was conveyed to Rhonda's parents, Gail and Milton, as well as her cousin Natasha, who were all in the company of their extended family when the authorities delivered the distressing update. Despite the passage of time, the exact cause of Rhonda's death remains unresolved, as noted by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation Crime Lab, which classifies it as undetermined. Following Rhonda's murder, Detectives extensively interviewed her classmates, who had been in her company during the hours leading up to the tragic incident. Additionally, investigators engaged in conversations with Rhonda's colleagues at the Hazelhurst Piggly Wiggly supermarket, where she held a position as a cashier. Their diligent pursuit of the killer persisted, even though they acknowledged that the individual initially deemed the primary suspect was exonerated after successfully completing a polygraph test. Notably, Authorities publicized a reward of $9,500 to encourage information that could lead to the apprehension of Rhonda's murderer. This initiative aimed to generate new leads that might aid in the identification of the perpetrator. Despite their conviction that Rhonda was acquainted with the person she entered a vehicle with, law enforcement faced challenges in pinpointing concrete suspects. On Wednesday, May 23, 1990, a funeral service was conducted for Rhonda. During the funeral service, attended by mourners, investigators scoured the parking lot, diligently searching for any trace of a dark-colored pickup truck with a brief bed, a vehicle description previously provided by a hunter. This specific truck type was suspected to have been used by Rhonda's presumed killer, and the investigators entertained the possibility that the perpetrator might attend her funeral. An individual, remaining unidentified, reached out to the detectives, claiming to have encountered the truck belonging to the alleged killer on the night Rhonda disappeared. Providing a partial license plate number, the informant recalled the truck being a combination of dark blue and white, with the plate containing the sequence 8374. The driver was described as male, sporting a striped shirt. In response, Sheriff Hall acknowledged the challenge posed by the 84 Georgia counties issuing license plates with the reported number sequence. Determined to explore all leads, they initiated their search in the counties closest to the incident. By June 1, 1990, the reward for pertinent information regarding Rhonda's case had surged to $15,000. Georgia Bureau of Investigation agent Martin Moses disclosed that investigators persisted in scrutinizing DV records to trace the truck's owner, yet no fresh insights had emerged. Moses affirmed their unwavering commitment. We're still going full speed. We're going to stay with it as long as it takes. For a span of two weeks, investigators diligently sifted through license plate records, eager to identify the plate indicated by the anonymous tipster. Despite their efforts, the individual failed to provide further information after the initial contact, leading detectives to conclude that the tip was ultimately a false lead. Time passed, and the progression of the months witnessed the case gradually losing momentum. Despite the detectives' fervent desire to apprehend the individual accountable for Rhonda's tragic demise, the influx of valuable tips dwindled, ultimately ceasing altogether. Exhaustively, they pursued every conceivable lead at their disposal. Regrettably, Sheriff Hall's pursuit to identify Rhonda's killer remained unfruitful. Tragically, on June 21, 1992, the 61-year-old sheriff met his end in a shootout involving a suspect he had once considered a friend. Subsequently, 
In January 1993, Jimmy Boatwright assumed the role of sheriff for Jeff Davis County. In discussions with the media, Boatwright asserted that his primary objective was resolving Rhonda's murder. He indicated that while investigators held a particular individual in suspicion, there was a lack of substantive evidence tying him to the crime. As time progressed, reaching 1998, eight years had elapsed since Rhonda's tragic passing. The case continued to be actively investigated, but substantial advancements had remained elusive for nearly as long. Despite the reward for information having escalated to $35,000, no individual had come forward to claim it. The passage of decades did not dispel the shroud of mystery enveloping the identity of Rhonda's perpetrator. Rhonda's case recently gained renewed attention through its spotlight on the Fox Hunter podcast, unraveling fresh details that invigorated the quest for justice on her behalf. The Fox Hunter podcast delved deeply into various leads, potential murder suspects, and additionally prompted the emergence of fresh leads and tips sparked by its coverage. Spanning a 10-episode series, the podcast immerses listeners in the multifaceted realm of this case. Given the temporal distance of over 30 years since the incident occurred, some of the individuals who were once suspects or witnesses have since passed away. Among the figures presented in the podcast is Greg Newham, Rhonda's former boyfriend. Throughout the podcast, Rhonda's parents reveal that she terminated her relationship with Greg approximately a month before her tragic demise. This was partly due to Greg's increasing jealousy and possessiveness, prompting him to make a desperate plea through Milton, Rhonda's father, to reconcile their relationship. In the wake of Rhonda's murder, an intriguing detail emerges. Greg's extended stay at the Coleman residence over the course of a weekend, curiously, Despite his proximity to the investigation, he refrained from participating in distributing flyers or joining the search efforts, opting to remain confined within the house. An intriguing twist emerges as a friend of Rhonda comes forward during the podcast, revealing that Greg had privately confessed to having seen Rhonda in town mere minutes prior to her abduction and eventual demise. This revelation offers a new dimension to Greg's involvement in the events of that fateful day. Additionally, the friend notes the presence of a gas can in the back of Greg's truck, adding another layer of intrigue to the story. Despite these peculiarities, Greg had an established alibi for the time of the crime and was never officially named as a public suspect. One figure, John Strickland, emerges as an early person of interest in the investigation. According to accounts shared with the podcast host, John exhibited aggressive tendencies. He was in a relationship with Rhonda's best friend, Trice Thompson at the time, and allegations of his controlling and abusive behavior circulated. An altercation between John and Rhonda occurred shortly before her and timely murder. The context of the dispute stemmed from Rhonda's attempt to convince her friend to sever ties with John and partake in a post-graduation cruise organized by the senior class. This endeavor sparked the confrontation between John and Rhonda, as recounted in the podcast. Another figure under scrutiny is Mark Hall Jr. Numerous theories cast suspicion on him as the potential perpetrator behind Rhonda's demise. The Fox Hunter podcast episode delves into the recollections of Mitchell Wood, a Hazelhurst, Georgia, resident who shared a lifelong friendship with Rhonda, grew up in the same town, and graduated in 1990 from Jeff Davis High School. According to Wood's statements to law enforcement, he witnessed Rhonda Sue Coleman and Mark Hall together on the roadside the night of her abduction and murder. During this encounter, Hall allegedly threatened Wood, telling him to leave to avoid trouble. Wood's account of the incident was verified through a polygraph test administered by a retired Georgia Bureau of Investigation polygraph examiner who confirmed the truthfulness of his narration regarding the events of the night Rhonda Coleman was taken. Mark's father held the position of sheriff in the town, and Mark himself was a deputy, fueling speculation that he may have committed the crime, aided by his father's influence in covering it up. Rumors have circulated that he had a romantic relationship with Rhonda, and further claims allege that she was pregnant and had tasked Mark with revealing the truth to his wife under the threat of Rhonda disclosing the information herself. Although Mark initially denied knowing Rhonda, a friend of hers contradicted this claim by asserting his familiarity with her. Remarkably, 
during the podcast, Mark Hall Jr. volunteered to undergo a lie detector test, successfully passing it, an event that adds complexity to the narrative. Within the podcast's narrative, a local figure named Roy Robertson has put forward serious allegations implicating Mickey Beecher and Mark Hall Jr. in the unresolved killing of Rhonda Sue Coleman in May 1990. According to Robertson's account, Mickey Beecher essentially made a confession regarding his participation in the events leading up to Rhonda's death and the actual murder on the night of May 17, 1990, in Hazelhurst, Georgia. Furthermore, Robertson asserts that Jeff Davis County Sheriff Mark Hall confided in him, revealing that his own son, Mark Hall Jr., played a role in abducting and ultimately killing Rhonda. Robertson conveyed Mark Hall had reached the point that he knew he was going to have to arrest his son. It was eating Mark alive. Speaking to podcast host Sean Kipe, Robertson elaborated on Sheriff Mark Hall's internal struggle concerning Mark Hall's involvement in the demise of the 19-year-old high school senior from Hazlehurst, Georgia. The question arises, can Robertson's allegations be considered credible? Additionally, it prompts one to ponder the reason behind Robertson's decision to come forward with this information after so many years have transpired. Frustrated by years of fruitless investigations, Milton and Gale made a pivotal decision in August 2017. They enlisted the services of retired officer Jody Ponsell, formerly of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, to aid in their relentless pursuit of justice in the Rhonda suitcase. Despite not being initially assigned to Rhonda's case, while at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Officer Ponzel has taken the lead in conducting independent interviews and collaborating with the Coleman's attorney, Ken Smith. The ongoing efforts have yielded promising outcomes from various witnesses, though certain uncooperative witnesses have also provided valuable insights, shedding light on the case's complexities. Officer Ponzel, who had been associated with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation during the time of Rhonda's tragic demise, expressed his disappointment in the handling of the case so far, indicating a series of regrettable missteps over the years. Reflecting on the situation, he emphasized the case's surprising resilience, challenging the notion that it had grown as cold as perceived by the public. Rhonda's case, to this day, remains unresolved. In April 2023, a significant development occurred as the Coleman-Baker Act was enshrined into Georgia law. This legislative act dedicates $5.4 million to assist in the resolution of cold case homicides, establishing a specialized unit within the Georgia Bureau of Investigation for the purpose. Currently, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation maintains its commitment to probing the circumstances surrounding Rhonda's tragic murder. The investigative focus has honed in on several primary suspects, individuals whom both law enforcement and investigators posit could have potentially acted either independently or collaboratively in the crime. Remarkably, all these individuals continue to reside within the local vicinity. Law enforcement's conviction maintains a firm belief that there are individuals within the vicinity who possess critical knowledge about the events leading to Rhonda's demise, but have chosen to remain silent, influenced by a variety of factors. The introduction of a reward system could potentially encourage these individuals to come forward and share crucial information. Undaunted by the temporal distance that has elapsed, Rhonda's family continues to clamor for justice. Their determination remains steadfast and unwavering, despite the inevitable march of time. The closing chapters of the Rhonda Sue Coleman murder case resonate with haunting persistence. A story that unfurled in Hazelhurst, Georgia, on May 17, 1990, has evolved into a labyrinth of mysteries, unanswered questions, and unsettling possibilities. As we delve into the resolution, or lack thereof, of this enigma, a sense of both frustration and intrigue envelops us. The layers of this chilling narrative remind us that the pursuit of justice can be an arduous journey fraught with twists and turns that test the tenacity of investigators and the patience of those who yearn for closure. Rhonda Sue Coleman, a vivacious 18-year-old, met her untimely demise on that fateful night. The mysteries of her abduction, the haunting scream that resonated in the woods, and the discovery of her partially charred body in a secluded area continue to provoke curiosity and speculation. 
unraveling the clues that weave through potential suspects. A former boyfriend, a deputy sheriff, an abusive acquaintance, the puzzle remains unsolved. The podcast Fox Hunter breathes life into the investigation, showcasing the power of media to reignite interest and perhaps even coax long hidden truths to the surface. Time has not erased the pain of her absence. Her parents, determined to rewrite her story, find solace in their unyielding search for the truth. As the Coleman-Baker Act manifests, an infusion of resources and renewed vigor embark on a mission to pierce through the shroud of mystery that has eluded resolution for years. Within this convoluted web of suspicion, regrettable missteps and missed opportunities, Rhonda Sue Coleman's story stands as a haunting testament to the relentless pursuit of truth. The lingering shadows of potential witnesses and unspoken truths echo in the present, a poignant reminder that justice is not always swift, but the quest for it remains undeterred, waiting for the day when the light of truth will pierce through the darkness, giving closure to a story that has captivated hearts and minds for decades. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Let us know in the comments if there are any true crimes or unsolved mysteries you'd like us to explore. And as always, stay safe out there. Until next time,